So as Tamara was saying, linear models are extremely widely used across the, uh, the sciences and social sciences to uncover interpretable relationships within data. But available statistical tools for linear modeling fail when, as in many modern settings, the data are high dimensional. So in my thesis, I built theoretically grounded tools that address these high dimensional problems. <clears throat> but why should we care about linear models in the first place? As a motivation, let's consider this question of how do differences in people's genetics influence aspects of their health? For example, the risk of developing bipolar disorder. One strategy for addressing, oh, okay. Let me just fix that. Uh, Is this uh, visible over Zoom now? Great. <clears throat> Perfect. <laughs> uh, yeah, so as I was saying, one strategy to answer these sorts of questions about how differences in people's genetics uh, impact the development of disease is to collect gen genetic information from many individuals, some with uh, who are healthy and others like with, with uh, like these, these disease conditions. <clears throat> and look for uh, like places in the, in the genome where the sequence differs from the common sequence. <clears throat> and in particular, uh, places where it's also correlated with disease. But the genome is also super large and there are many different places where these differences can contribute to disease. So our goal is going to be to understand the many contributing factors and the sizes of, of the effects that they have. <clears throat> and um, Although like neural networks and other complex models might seem to be solving like every problem these days, for problems like this where interpretability is really the goal, uh, the simplicity of linear models has meant that they've remained ubiquitous and in, in the go-to across the sciences. But there's some challenges to applying linear models in high dimensional settings like this. So in particular, there's a lot of variation throughout the genome that could be associated with this disease state, but isn't actually causing this variation. So it's important to disentangle these real versus spurious correlations that lead to uncertainty in the, the conclusions that we, we want to make. A second challenge is that we're often interested in not just one disease, but several. And we have multiple sources of data that we'd like to combine uh, so that we can learn about all of these, these different things. In principle, Bayesian statistics can provide a solution to these problems. It provides uh, the ability to uh, have coherent quantification of our uncertainty uh, and to reduce that uncertainty uh, by combining multiple groups of data. If we know, as we do in this case, that there may be similar similarities in the underlying factors in these different data sets. <clears throat> um, but <clears throat> although like in, in some sense, Bayesian methodology has been developing over 200 years, the questions that we're, we're asking recently, since new technologies and internet scale data have been giving us data sets where we might want to consider thousands or even up to millions of possible explanatory factors. In this high dimensional setting, I and others have shown that existing methods can fail uh, or, or don't work well enough in this high dimensional setting. So in my research, uh, I've been developing new methods that overcome the challenges posed by high dimensions. <clears throat> but to explain what these problems are, are in a bit more depth and, and to get into it further, I need to talk a little bit about the Bayesian workflow. Um, and typically, we think of this as involving choices split across different, uh, three different stages of analysis, modeling, inference, and evaluation. In modeling, we formulate a precise mathematical description of our data and our assumptions, and how uh, formalizing the, the things that we want to learn from our data as unknowns, and using the language of probability to do this. The second step of inference, we take this model and our data and translate it into algorithms that can run on a computer and operating on our data and give us possible conclusions. And in this final stage of evaluation, <clears throat> uh, we scrutinize our conclusions and ask questions like, uh, if we performed a sophisticated analysis, did we actually end up with more precise conclusions than we could have gotten with a much simpler approach? <clears throat> and the issue is that problems aren't occurring just at one place, but across this entire pipeline. So in my PhD work, uh, I've tried to provide methods that address the, the challenges for linear models in high dimensions at all three of these stages, with a focus on providing methods that are theoretically sound and broadly applicable so that we can use them on not just applications in genetics, but also much more broadly. To get in a little bit deeper, 
In modeling, I show that existing models miss patterns that are common in high dimensional data. So I propose new ones that capture this structure. In inference, I show that existing algorithms uh, can either be too slow or too inaccurate. So I propose new ones that uh, we know are fast and, and can prove are, are accurate. And then uh, in evaluation, uh, many Bayesian methods often rely on subjective assumptions about our, our, our data. And it's hard to assess the relative performance between different approaches that have this favor when we're uh, applying them in, in high dimensional settings. So I've worked on, uh, yeah, on, on, on coming up with automated criteria that allow one to assess their conclusions in an assumption, uh, in an assumption lean manner. But since I can't go into depth into all of these different areas, today I'm gonna to focus on just one story uh, within this, uh, this category of modeling, where I'm going to show that uh, a new method that, that I've come up with with uh, uh, my collaborators um, will perform better in this high dimensional setting by modeling correlations across data sets rather than within them, which is a more standard approach. Okay, so as a roadmap for the talk, since the contributions I'll, I'll be talking about relate to linear models, I'll first start with some background on linear models, as well as Bayesian inference uh, in, these, in these models, as well as how these things look in the high dimensional setting, where we have many different explanatory factors that we're considering. I'll then discuss this particular method I just mentioned for modeling correlations across data sets rather than within them. Third, I'll talk about some connection statistical genetics. So this work came out of collaboration with statistical geneticists, and I'll discuss some connections to, to that work there, and in particular, this notion of genetic correlation. Um, in order to use this method, we're going to require fast algorithms for inference. So I'll talk about some of the technical challenges that we've overcome in developing these. And then finally, I'll talk about some of the benefits of, uh, of this new method in high dimensions, both with theor theoretical and empirical support. So to get started with uh, some, some background notation, I'm actually gonna introduce this in the context of a completely different example from genetics to emphasize the generality of this approach. So for this example, imagine we're interested in relating student participation in a free lunch program to those students' uh, academic success. So in this setting, we could have as our data for each of N students in a school, <clears throat> uh, what we'll call the response Y, as their change in performance, they me measured uh, with their uh, standardized test scores as, as a proxy. And yeah, calling that the response. In a linear model, we say that this response uh, uh, is equal to a covariate, which in this case would correspond to participation in that program. So this X would be equal to one if the student were in the free lunch program and a zero otherwise, times an effect beta, which represents the impact that this program would have on student success. This is the thing that we wanna learn from our analysis plus a residual epsilon, which coarsely is capturing all of the other factors. <clears throat> and with this very simple setup, there are many ways that we can think about getting uh, an estimate of this effect beta. But what I wanna talk about today is what if we have uh, data from multiple different schools? So say we have one school in Cambridge, another one in Boston, a third in Dallas. Well, we can incorporate that into this model uh, by adding notation to index the different schools that we're talking about. So adding a G into this notation for school G going from one up to, to G, big G equals three in this case. <clears throat> and, uh, but now we have a few different analysis options. So a first option would be to just combine all of the data together into one data set, um, do a kind of standard single data set approach and report just one single effect back. But this is the limitation that it ignores differences that could exist between the schools. So maybe the effect of this program is different in Cambridge than it is in, in Boston or Dallas. <clears throat> so alternatively, in order to capture that, we might think of analyzing these different data sets entirely independently. And we can add this into our notation as well by adding a super superscript G saying that now we have a different effect for each of these schools. But this also has limitations. And in particular, it could provide worse performance if we're data limited. Because if we only have a couple students per school, there's going to be a lot of noise just coming from those, those small samples. So the third option, which has been my focus, is a middle ground where we try to, to partially pool uh, between these different data sets and get the best of both, both worlds. And the motivation for this is that uh, if the effect of this free lunch program is similar in these schools, then maybe what we see in Cambridge and Dallas can inform our conclusions about what's going on in Boston. While at the same time, making room for the possibility that these, might, these effects might not be exactly the same. And this is exactly what we hope to do with a Bayesian statistical approach. 
But to use Bayesian statistics, we require a few different ingredients. So I'll talk about those right now. The first is the prior distribution. So this is a representation of our subjective beliefs before seeing data into the language of probabilities. And what we do here is we codify our assumptions about things like this data set similarity into the language of probability. So being able to, to say, uh, translating, if I think that the true effect of this program in Cambridge and Boston is maybe within about 10%, uh, translating that into thinking, into to saying, I think that this beta for Cambridge and the beta for Boston is Gaussian distributed with uh, standard deviation 10%. The second piece is the likelihood, which relates uh, these unknowns and these effects to the data that we observe. And third, Bayes rule uh, tells us how to update our, our beliefs after we see data into the posterior distribution of the parameter uh, after we've conditioned on, on seeing our data. And this is going to be the computational step that's going to require algorithms and will be particularly challenging when we have many different parameters that we're trying to, to handle. A last component um, is empirical Bayes, which answers this question of what do I do if I don't know how to choose the specific details uh, in setting my prior? And the somewhat counterintuitive, counterintuitive idea of empirical Bayes is to use the data to help us make this choice and automate this process. And essentially, in essence, what we do with this is we try to learn the extent of partial pooling in a way that's less subjective than just specifying this arbitrary 10% standard deviation. <clears throat> uh, there's one final piece of uh, complexity in our notation that I'm going to add up and that I'm going to add in here which is what do we do if we, have, uh, if we know more about each student? So if we now have multiple covariates for each student, so say we, uh, in addition to knowing if they were in this free lunch program, we also know if they played a sport, what their past performance was, maybe demographic information as well. We add this into our notation uh, by adding a subscript D to index all these different characteristics of the schools, uh, both into the covariates and into the effects. In summing over these potential contributions of these different factors uh, in, in, into the response. Um, and although now each of the individual pieces of this model are relatively simple, we've come into quite a lot of notation. So before moving forward, I'll just summarize this here. So we now have D different covariates that we're dealing with. So these correspond to the different student attributes. We have G data sets corresponding to the different schools that we're, we're talking about. And then we have in each school, uh, NG samples in, in, that, uh, in, in that data set G, corresponding to the number of students in that school. <clears throat> and altogether, now since we have multiple effects in each of these multiple schools, we can think of the parameter that we want to estimate as being a big matrix that I'll just write as uh, simply as beta without the subscripts, <clears throat> uh, containing G columns corresponding to the different data sets and D rows corresponding to the different covariates. And if we want to take a Bayesian analysis to inferring these effects, the question that we need to answer is that we need to answer first is what prior do we put on this matrix? But before going into my answer to this question, let's uh, take a look back at the more standard approach, uh, which dates back 50 years to the work of Lindley and Smith, because our work inherits quite closely from it. So in the standard approach from, from Lindley and Smith, they argue that in the absence of conflicting information, we should simplify the problem uh, to, to start by making the assumption that the order of the data sets doesn't matter for the effects. So for example, if we're considering hundreds of schools and cities throughout the country, we forget about any ways in which each of the schools could be unique. We then suggest to model the correlations uh, in effects across the covariates. So for example, if we're interested in, uh, in, in, in modeling the effects of playing soccer and playing baseball, we consider the possibility that if in a given school playing soccer is especially beneficial to performance, that maybe um, playing baseball is also especially beneficial in that school. Uh, we then think of representing all of these possible correlations um, and, and describing them for, D, for if we have DFX into this D by D matrix that I'll write as, uh, as gamma. <clears throat> so a bit more formally, this is justified through the idea of a priori exchangeability of effects across, uh, across covariates. <clears throat> so we would say that uh, this beta is a priori exchangeable across data sets. Um, if for every, uh, according to our prior distribution P, if for every G permutation sigma corresponding to a reordering of these, uh, the columns of this matrix, 
the prior probability of these effects is the same before and after this shuffling. And the significance of this assumption is that in the limit of a, a very large number of data sets, Definetti's theorem provides that there's an equivalent parameterized representation of our prior beliefs, such that the effects for each school, these beta Gs, are uh, conditionally, identically, and independently distributed, uh, conditional on that parameterization. And although uh, Definetti's theorem doesn't tell us anything about what form we should use for this prior distribution, a particularly convenient choice in what Wendley and Smith proposed doing is the multivariate Gaussian with covariance gamma, the same matrix that I introduced up above. And because it's not always intuitive how to uh, choose up, up to, to begin with what the correlations between each of the effects are here, the standard way to, to choose these is via empirical base. <clears throat> Since this approach was, uh, was introduced 50 years ago, it's become ubiquitous in statistics, both in software. So for example, it's implemented by default in uh, this package LME4, which is perhaps the most widely used statistical software package. Like it's been downloaded uh, yeah, about 20 million times. <clears throat> and also in pedagogy. So you'll find this approach in uh, like standard intro level uh, college textbooks on statistics. Um, but this approach has some limitations in the high dimensional setting where we have more covariates than we have data sets. So in particular, it can be really unintuitive if we have say just three schools, like the one in uh, Cambridge, Boston, and Dallas. <clears throat> and uh, in each of these schools have dozens of different features of the students in them. So a lot of information that seems to uh, tell us that, uh, yeah, I mean, how these student bodies could be different. And this exchangeability assumption, assuming the ordering doesn't matter, means that we're unable to say that Cambridge and Boston might be more similar to one another than they are to Dallas. <clears throat> uh, second limitation, is that we have on the order of d squared parameters that we have to represent in this covariance matrix gamma, which is going to introduce statistical and computational challenges, in particular in this empirical base step where we need to choose the value for it. Again, think for expanding up to genetic settings with um, I mean, many thousands of covariates, right? Then we could have hundreds of thousands, millions of uh, parameters in this matrix to contend with. And then next, as I'll show you soon, this just says poor, uh, poor, poor performance empirically in terms of uh, accuracy of effect estimation. <clears throat> and and I'll, I'll get into that uh, in a bit. But in light of these limitations, you might think uh, that it would be more natural to, instead of assuming exchangeability across the data sets um, and modeling the correlations across the effects, it would make more sense to do things the other way around. And that's just precisely what our approach is. So we start by assuming exchangeability uh, in the parameters across the covariates. So this means we're first grouping the effects by the rows of this matrix here, and assuming we can shuffle the, the, the order of these, these rows and that, that wouldn't make a difference in terms of how likely we think they are a priori. Um, and then second, we think about modeling the correlations in beta uh, for each of these effects across data sets rather than um, across the different covariates. <clears throat> and just as Lindley and Smith proposed modeling each of the beta Gs as um, normally distributed with this covariance gamma, we were going to do the same thing, but now instead with this G by G covariance matrix sigma, <clears throat> which will be able to capture things like uh, Boston and Cambridge being more similar to one another than they are to, to, to Dallas. <clears throat> but in order to use this approach, we still need to fill in a few de details so that we can actually use this model. A first, uh, a first thing is that we need practical algorithms for posterior inference and for doing this empirical base step. And we need to, to do this in such a way that we can actually apply them in these high dimensional settings. There will be computational challenges there. And then the second thing is that because we don't have 50 years of, of evidence of people using this, saying that it's a good idea, we're going to need theory and experiments to justify whether and when this is actually effective. <clears throat> and I'll get to those, uh, those validations soon, but to give a first taste, we can see super clearly the regimes in which this does, does well by looking at a simulation study. So in the simulation results that I'll show right now, we're going to look at uh, estimation error for simulated data sets with a different number of covariates. So increasing to higher dimensional regime as we move to the right on the x-axis. And I've marked here uh, a kind of critical boundary point in these simulations, which involve uh, 10 groups of data with this, this dotted line. So to the left of this dotted line, we're in a setting where we have fewer covariates than we have data sets. And on the right side, we're in a setting, the high dimensional setting where we have uh, more covariates than, than we have data sets. What we see is that 
if we compare the standard approach to doing independent analyses where we don't try to share strength, <clears throat> um, we see that this, the standard approach is providing smaller error in the low dimensional regime. But in the high dimensional setting, the standard approach is providing remarkably worse performance. And this effect is so pronounced that the software package I mentioned on the last slide won't even run in this high dimensional setting when D is greater than G. By contrast, our approach, starting with exchangeability across covariates, does effectively share strength in this high dimensional regime. So although it provides worse performance in this lower dimensional setting, when we move to high dimensions, we are actually getting reduced error. And one thing that's useful uh, about this is that when we approach a new problem, it's very easy to check, like, what is the number of covariates that I'm working with? How many data sets? So we know which of these approaches to use. So although these approaches are, are very conceptually similar, we see that they have dramatically different uh, dependence on dimension. Uh, yeah, and it, this can, can have, have a huge difference, a huge practical difference to performance. So hopefully by this point, I've convinced you that I'm doing something here that might be worthwhile and that there's hope that this uh, could be working in high dimensional settings. So I'll take this opportunity to uh, take a step back and discuss how I got to this approach, which is through statistical genetics um, and discuss its relation to this idea of genetic correlation. And this work in genetics comes to a large extent from questions like, to what extent do correlated traits have similar underlying genetics? And <clears throat> yeah, so for example, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, the genetic basis of traits like extreme creativity and also mental health. So think of famous examples like uh, Ernest Hemingway and, and Virginia Woolf, and also more recently, Kanye West um, or R Robin Williams. <clears throat> so uh, one, one goal of statistical genetics is, try to, is to try to take a, a formal statistical approach to answer questions like this. And as Tamara had mentioned at the start, the workhorse of statistical genetics, like many of these other areas, is the linear model. In fact, the same equation that we had on the previous slide but now in this case, uh, why is, uh, our, our response Y is describing a phenotype or trait that we have in each of N in individuals rather than N students. Um, our D different effects correspond to uh, D different genetic variants uh, or SNPs. <clears throat> X is going to be the genotype of individuals. So we could think of encoding uh, this as a one in places where uh, we're differing from the common sequence and a zero in the places where someone does have the common, common sequence. And this beta will correspond to the genetic effects associated with, with, that, look, with that, that place in the geome. And then often we think of this residual term as corresponding to just the environmental factors that, that don't come with genetics but explain trait variation. Similarly, we can use this model to describe multiple traits at the same time. And we do this by introducing a superscript G to index the, the different traits. And now we again have this uh, whole set, this whole matrix of, of different, uh, uh, different effects in this parameter beta. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> now, painting in, in, in very broad strokes, this model is useful because uh, in, in this setting, because it allows us to, to talk about phenotypic correlation, say uh, between two traits, G equal to creativity, and uh, G prime is bipolar disorder. It's the sum of contributions from environment uh, and contributions from, uh, 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 from genetics that we'll call genetic correlation. And again, I'll, I'll emphasize that uh, this adding correlations together is, is really just kind of a, a note for, uh, for intuition rather than something that, that's mathematically meaningful. <clears throat> but this notion of genetic correlation has been used uh, really increasingly widely in genetics to do things like quantify pleiotropy, uh, detect associations uh, between differences in, in, in the genome and disease with higher power, and to produce more accurate uh, assessments of disease risk. Moreover, uh, uh, moreover, Bullock, Sullivan, Finucane, and others have proposed um, a, a way uh, have proposed that, that we could define the genetic correlation between two, two traits as the correlation between these uh, beta Ds, um, <clears throat> yeah, for e each variant across those these two different traits. And if we assume that each of the, the these beta Ds so these G vectors now of effects for each, uh, each variant are normally distributed with covariance sigma. So much, well, almost, almost the same prior on, on this, this previous slide, then uh, genetic correlation ends up reducing to precisely like a rescaling of this matrix. So after realizing this, I assume that this paradigm that's really widely used in statistics, very close to this mainstream idea of, uh, of exchangeability across data sets, 
and seems much more effective in these modern high dimensional settings, must have already leapt outside of uh, genetics by now and become mainstream within statistics. But surprisingly, it seems like this really isn't the case. And from digging deeper, our best understanding of why is that the provenance of this idea, the provenance of this idea of genetic correlation has served as a roadblock to its generalization beyond, uh, beyond genetics. <clears throat> so reading into this, this literature, uh, starting from about 2012 to now, uh, we can see that it's largely an application of older linear effects models uh, developed in the 1970s, uh, <clears throat> particularly, uh, yeah, uh, uh, particularly oriented towards applications in, in cattle breeding, where having knowledge about uh, the shared genetics between traits like a cow's uh, resistance to disease and how much milk it produces can aid decisions about the parents to choose for next generations of livestock. And although this approach was contemporary with the work of Lindley and Smith, it's around the same time, who introduced this idea of exchangeability across data sets, this actually inherits from a much earlier idea um, of genetic correlation introduced at least as early as 1943 in a paper by Hazel. What's interesting about this uh, is that 1943, <clears throat> uh, is that 1943 predates even the first knowledge, um, yeah, uh, sh shown by Avery, McCloyd, and McCarty of DNA as the genetic material which means that this notion of genetic correlation is entirely predating DNA, which is exactly what we think of as the appropriate covariates, the things that have effects in this linear model. And so circumvented this need for exchangeability and, and correlated effects. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, and relying really entirely on, on the intuitiveness of this idea of genetic correlation and, and its empirical success. So on the statistical side, uh, this parallel view of exchangeability across covariate effects has managed to say uh, almost entirely, uh, an entirely unknown, with the only exceptions that I'm aware of being a brief paper, uh, a brief theoretical paper uh, by Brown and Zidek in 1980, and a single follow-up by Hytovsky in 87, where both works uh, are quite limited to the case where all data sets comprise of uh, exactly the same set of data points. Uh, and so don't apply to cases like this education example that I was showing on the first slide. <clears throat> Furthermore, since these approaches were developed in the 1980s before the proliferation of high dimensional data sets for which it seems that this is really useful, they seem to have largely been forgotten. So uh, our work, which we uh, yeah, introduced just last year um, against this backdrop provides a few different contributions. So a first contribution is uh, a general modeling framework with a broader applicability beyond, uh, beyond genetics that we justified through this idea of exchangeability of effects across, uh, across covariates. Um, we provide fast algorithms, not, not tailored to some of the specifics of genetics, uh, which is often very concerned with the, also this case where we have uh, all of our responses observed for each of our data points. And um, uh, yeah, and, and uh, considering also cases where we have a lot of correlation structure in our noise across the data sets. <clears throat> and then third, we provide theory and empirics that provide uh, empirical, yeah, that, that, that provide support for our method in this setting where the number of covariates is greater than the number of data sets. So to recap, so far I've argued that, um, yeah, the existing tools for, uh, yeah, for statistical, for statistical modeling don't work effectively in high dimensions. I've explained the Bayesian paradigm and what it looks like when we apply it to, to high dimensional data. I propose this, this method of uh, modeling correlations across data sets rather than within them. And just now talked about uh, connections to, to statistical genetics. Um, so next uh, piece, I'll talk about the fast algorithms that we've developed in order to use this in practice. So as a reminder, when we're being Bayesian, we need these two ingredients of the prior and the likelihood. So I've shown our prior already, and it's we're assuming that each of these beta Ds are normally distributed with that covariance matrix sigma. For our likelihood, we're assuming that uh, each of these responses is equal to a sum of effects uh, corresponding to these different covariates with, uh, uh, with, with a normally distributed residual with a variance little sigma squared. Then to estimate uh, uh, this parameter, uh, we propose using the posterior mean. So this is uh, the average integrating over this whole parameter space of these matrices and weighting them by their uh, posterior probability, this is P beta given, the, uh, given our observations Y. 
And I'll denote this, uh, this, this estimate that we get out by beta hat u code for exchangeability across covariates. Um, <clears throat> and typically, uh, this step of posterior inference is a step that, uh, that can be very computationally challenging. <clears throat> um, but in this case, because of this convenient choice of uh, the normal as, as our prior, I mentioned computational tractability uh, and, and that, that, that ease as a motivation for that. Uh, we have conjugacy in the posterior, which means that we have an analytic form for, uh, for this estimate beta hat. And we avoid having to use uh, approximate inference algorithms like variational Bayes or Markov chain Monte Carlo. Um, but applying conjugacy in this setting is a little bit more complicated than usual because the parameter that we're trying to estimate is a matrix. So, in a, so, so our approach is to turn this into a vector estimation problem, which simply just means we first unpack this matrix um, by stacking its columns into one big long vector of size G times D. And then once we have that, we can apply the standard conjugacy formulas that you'll find in your favorite machine learning textbook. Um, for example, in Bishop, let's say that we can now find this as uh, yeah, as, as this by, by crunching together matrices and, and just doing doing linear algebra, which I'm showing this equation here really just for the sake of completeness. Uh, but there is a catch, which is that right, this answer to this problem is the solution to a very high dimensional linear system with G times D parameters. So if we're in a, a genetics type application where maybe we have thousands of different uh, covariates that we're dealing with and dozens of data sets, we could have hundreds of thousands of covariates, hundreds of thousands of effects that we were trying to estimate. So this could be uh, very computationally difficult to, to solve. But in our paper, we show that we can actually still make this tractable with even up to the order of a million FX that we're estimating by using a conjugate gradient algorithm, which takes advantage of special structure in this matrix, uh, notably that it's, it's well-conditioned, it has its smallest eigenvalues are not, not, not too small, and it has sparse structure that allow for fast matrix multiplies. Um, and next, uh, I'll note that right, this estimate isn't actually well-defined. We can't actually compute it until we've chosen a value for this matrix sigma. Right, and this is the problem that we needed empirical Bayes for. And then I described empirical Bayes as, as, solution, as the solution to uh, before. And that's also exactly what we propose to do. So we say, let's choose as our, as our uh, estimate for, for these covariances of sigma, the, the matrix that maximizes the likelihood of all the data marginalizing under, over the unknown parameter. And the intu intuition for this is that uh, if the similarity uh, of effects between different groups is similar across all the different covariates, then the, the, the data uh, will appear more likely for sigma that, that uh, captures these correlations. And if we're able to learn that, then we can use this to do a better job of inferring all of the effects. In contrast, though, to the solution to, to this computational problem of uh, finding the posterior mean, uh, the solution to this optimization problem does not have an analytic solution. So in order to address that, uh, we've developed a, a fast iterative expectation, maximiz ex expectation maximization algorithm uh, that, that finds the solution to that optimization problem. <clears throat> okay, so now we have a, a method that's going to give us a, an estimate that we can compute anytime we have our collection of G different data sets assuming that they have this same set of covariates, where the first step is we use empirical Bayes to choose an estimate of, uh, of this matrix sigma. And then second, we do posterior inference using that equation from the, the previous slide to get our estimate of beta hat e cove. <clears throat> Earlier, I tried to convince you that we know that this is working in high dimensions <clears throat> from these simulation results, where in high dimensions, we're, we're getting smaller error. But how do we actually get this, this, this plot? Where did these simulations come from? So the way that we, we, we did this is for each of these different numbers of, COVID, uh, of, of effects, I, on a computer, chose randomly uh, yeah, these values of these effects, uh, sampling them from a normal distribution with a chosen covariance matrix sigma. Then sample data sets, y from the likelihood defined by these parameters that I drew, and then on each of them computed uh, the sum of the squared errors across all the covariates. And then repeated this many times with many different sample data sets. So the y-axis here uh, is actually the, the mean squared error across many different replicates of, of this process. And the point of doing this is to try to get at um, 
this kind of like large sample behavior, the average uh, error across many, yeah, in the limit of having very many repeated data sets, which in statistics we know is the risk, uh, which I'll write as R of uh, beta hat beta, because it depends both on the estimator that we're using, so which of these three lines we're talking about, as well as the true unknown effects. So looking at this, you might ask, well, how do we assess if this actually works more generally? This seems like these results are really quite specific to this setup and kind of having this best case scenario where the parameters that we're trying to, to estimate are exactly meeting the assumptions of our model. So one idea to, to try to assess if this is working more generally would be to try to do even more simulations, doing this with a wider variety of, of many different various betas. But this is, a, is, is problematic and isn't going to, to solve a problem entirely because there are infinitely many possible matrices that we could have tried in these simulations. And we can't try them all. And we want to know in a new, new application, is this actually better? So a second idea would be to use a real data set to try this on. But fundamentally, this is going to have the same problem. And I'll, I'll get to some validation with, with real data soon. Um, but, but note that, that, yeah, I mean, if we try this on a few data sets in a new setting where there's a different uh, beta that we're trying to estimate, the, the properties could be, uh, could, could be different. So instead, we're going to go with a third idea, which is to use theory. And what this will allow us to do is to start with pen and paper and produce an understanding of yeah, when, when we, we can go out and apply this procedure and expect to get better results without having to actually do more experiments and, and, and rely on uh, more subjective choices of different, different, uh, different uh, applied data sets to, to benchmark on. So in this line of, uh, of reasoning, what we really want to ask is under what conditions on beta can we prove that, uh, yeah, can, can we prove that this risk function is small? <clears throat> and, and to do this with, with mathematics. But the challenge here is that right, this risk is, is defined as an expectation over this infinite realm of, of possible different observed data sets that we could observe. So it's an integral over this non-differentiable function of a matrix, right? So this empirical base step in particular introduces non-differentiability. So this is a, a difficult problem to handle. Using techniques that I, I won't be able to, to really get into in this talk though, we are uh, able to, 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 to still make some progress. <clears throat> and we find uh, the, the follow, following domination result, um, which says essentially that if we're in a high dimensional setting where we have uh, a large number of covariates, that's at least twice the number of uh, data sets that we're working with plus two. And if uh, the, the covariates, the X's in these problems are sufficiently well conditioned uh, in a way that we describe in detail in our paper, then for any beta, just so long as it's high dimensional enough, we have that the risk of our, our strategy, so assuming exchangeability across covariate effects using what I described on the previous slide, is gonna give a smaller risk than the least squares estimator, which is the classical approach that, that works super well in low dimensional settings that's been around for over 200 years. Um, so to summarize, right, what this, this theoretical result is telling us is that in high dimensions, we can expect this approach to do, uh, to do reasonably well. Furthermore, we're also able to prove that uh, this more standard approach, which I'm writing as e-data for exchangeability across data sets, starting with that analogous assumption and doing a similar thing, provides always higher risk than, than this strategy. So this is now using theory to, to back up this uh, statement that I made at the very beginning, that it's better to capture correlations across data sets than within them in the high dimensional setting. <clears throat> um, and the kind of crazy thing about this is that this approach is reducing the risk regardless of this beta. Um, and the reason why this is kind of wild is that we only really set out to use this approach because we expected these similarities to be there uh, in, in the data sets in the first place. But remarkably, we get this smaller error, even if, if that assumption isn't satisfied. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> but uh, there, there's still some, some, uh, some pieces that are unresolved and unsatisfied by a, a statistical domination result like this. So, what are the questions that are, that are still unanswered? So the first thing is that a result like this only tells us that uh, the risk is smaller than, uh, than the standard baseline. It doesn't tell us anything about the size of the improvement that we're getting, which we should really expect to depend on the similarity between the data sets. Um, <clears throat> and then a second limitation is that uh, it doesn't tell us anything about uh, whether we're getting this improvement from combining data across multiple groups. <clears throat> 
So in fact, this theorem also applies in the case where we have just a single data set and the number of covariates that we have is greater than four. And in that setting, right, there's only one data set, so we're clearly not getting this improvement by sharing strength. <clears throat> so for the next piece of this analysis, we're going to consider, uh, instead of just the ordering of the risks, we're going to look at the size of the risk improvement. So looking at uh, how much, how different is the risk for our approach if we apply it to all these data sets at once, versus if we apply it to each data set independently, which I'm going to write as uh, beta hat e cove independent. <clears throat> but here we run into to more challenges again. So in particular, uh, like, well, I'll, I'll note that uh, if we try to evaluate what this, this, this risk is here, again, we run into challenges in, in integration, the same, same challenges we had to overcome before, but become uh, even more, more difficult when we're trying to quantitatively look at this difference, which is that this risk uh, depends like, very directly on the distribution of the eigenvalues of a non-central Wishart matrix which are notoriously difficult to work with and, and computationally intractable. <clears throat> so in order to, to make this more tractable, we work with the reformulation of the problem. We do this in two different ways. So first we move to uh, an asymptotic setting where we consider a growing number of covariates. So this means sending D to, to infinity and considering uh, really hammering in on this, this very high dimensional regime where we could have arbitrarily many different covariates. And then so that we can coherently consider this growing collection and have more and more covariates, we move to a Bayesian analysis so that we can think of drawing additional beta Ds uh, from some distribution. And here I'll just write the assumed distribution as normal with uh, uh, some true covariance sigma star. <clears throat> and then finally, since now we're in this Bayesian setting, we're going to consider uh, the Bayes risk, which is going to be simply the expectation of uh, this normal frequentist risk up at the top of the slide, but averaging over all the possible different parameters uh, if we're drawing these with respect to uh, this, this chosen prior with covariance sigma star. And the second theorem that, that I'll show says that in this asymptotic regime, collecting uh, I mean, these, these larger and larger uh, numbers of covariates, that uh, we're never going to be getting uh, a larger risk if we use uh, this second estimator, beta hat e cove, instead of uh, this approach applied to independent analyses. So we're never doing worse by trying to, to share strength in this super high dimensional regime. And furthermore, um, we're able to show that uh, this, this difference, this risk improvement is uh, closely lower bounded by a, a rescaling of the distance between the eigenvalues of this matrix uh, sigma star and its entries along the di all, along its diagonal once we sort them both in descending order. Um, and intuitively, what this is telling us is that it's the distance between the eigenvalues of this matrix and its diagonals that's determining the extent to which we can share strength. And notably, we only end up with a large difference between these quantities when there's significant correlations uh, in, in this matrix, significant similarities between uh, the, the data sets in this set. As a final line of support, I'll show some empirical results demonstrating that this, this strategy uh, effectively shares strength uh, across multiple data sets in three diverse applications. And the challenge here um, is that I mean, our goal throughout has been to uh, assess um, yeah, our, our accuracy at, at estimating effects. But in real data, we can't uh, actually check the accuracy of effect estimation because we don't know the effects. That's the whole problem. So instead, we're going to be using prediction performance as a proxy for estimation. And here, uh, we're going to be evaluating the mean squared error uh, with five-fold cross-validation on these different data sets. Uh, as a first example, we consider using a linear model to relate uh, aspects of community demography to the rates of law enforcement for different crimes in several different regions of the country. So in this case, the responses correspond to the rate of law enforcement obtained from police data uh, in, these, uh, in these different communities. The covariates correspond to different demographic, demographic attributes. And then the G different data sets correspond to different uh, types of crime in different regions of the country. <clears throat> and here we can see that this classical strategy of least squares has high error and is quite variable as you can see with the large uh, standard errors here. Um, <clears throat> but by contrast, uh, our, our approach, which is, uh, yeah, uh, in blue is providing small error um, in this setting, effectively sharing strength. 
<clears throat> in a second application, um, where we, we look at uh, reader engagement and blog posts, we see a similar pattern with a slightly different ordering of these different other methods. So indicating that we're effectively uh, interpolating between these two different regimes where we want to share strength to a large extent and to a, 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 uh, or, or to a little extent, um, which is what was going on in that empirical base step. And then uh, in a third uh, quite different uh, application that's further afield that I won't uh, have time to really get into, we've also extended this approach <clears throat> uh, to classification problems where the responses we're working with are zero one valued. <clears throat> and here we also see that our approach is providing a good, uh, a good improvement. So across diverse applications, uh, this approach of exchangeability across covariates is improving predictions. <clears throat> so that's the end of, uh, of this first story, but I'll just briefly now summarize uh, some of my other work addressing other problems across uh, inference and evaluation. So often <clears throat> in linear models, uh, we, we are interested in also estimating interaction effects where uh, multiple uh, covariates interact super linearly to ha have an impact on, uh, yeah, on, on, on the response. So for these classes of models, we show how to, uh, to capture and report these efficiently at high dimensions. Um, additionally, so I was saying inference can be computationally very challenging in the high dimensional setting, but many data, data sets have low rank structure. So we've developed fast approximations that leverage the structure to provide fast and accurate inferences. And then third, uh, in, in, in collaboration with uh, Stan in particular uh, over there, <laughs> um, yeah, we, we've uh, yeah, done, done work on models over partition, that, uh, over partitions that require Markov chain Monte Carlo that can be slow. And here we've developed uh, uh, yeah, methods that can effectively do inference in these models uh, quickly by utilizing parallelism. And then finally, um, as I was saying at the start, Bayesian, model, Bayesian models typically involve subject, subjective assumptions. So we've uh, developed assumption lean criteria uh, to evaluate them that rely, that rely less heavily on these. To conclude, um, I'll, I'll just summarize that I've showed that uh, for these applications with multiple related data sets, it's more effective to model correlations uh, across data sets than within them in this high dimensional setting. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, you can check out our, our paper on this that we, we published last year. Um, and this fits into the broader picture of my PhD work on providing theoretically sound practical methods for linear models in high dimensions. <clears throat>